Okay, so now moving on to the forefoot. As you can see, we're going to be focusing primarily on sesamoid-related injuries and conditions, looking at the area of the fifth metatarsal in particular, and the area of the first uh, MTP, and a couple other conditions, but certainly there are, other, are a few other here that you can look up as well. Starting with sesamoid fracture. Main thing with this, uh, commonly the medial sesamoid, but about 30% of uh, individuals have a bipartite sesamoid in this area. So it certainly needs to be on a differential and uh, when looking at an x-ray, you need to be quite careful with this diagnosis as uh, there are other conditions that can mimic this and certainly if you do see a bipartite sesamoid, um, looking, uh, or if you're considering that, looking at the comparison side to see if it is bilateral or not may help not may help you with this diagnosis. Um, usually this is a direct blow or jumping activity that can, uh, causes this. And you're looking for point tenderness beneath the metatarsal head and below the sesamoid. And uh, you certainly oftentimes will have pain with MTP extension as well or, or doing a heel raise or rising up on, on their toes. Usually fractures transverse and what you're looking for is that the, the absence of cortication with abrupt edges and uh, as I said before, not bilateral. With a sesamoid fracture, uh, really treatment is uh, you can we use a few different options here. Uh, weight bearing is, is tolerated with an air cast or uh, a well padded walking cast for three or four weeks, or even a hard sole shoe or a molded orthotic with a donut or C pad over the sesamoid for uh, six to eight weeks or so. Um, if certainly symptoms are persisting uh, beyond six months, considering a referral for a potential excision or screw fixation is, is possible. Sesamoiditis is an inflammatory condition or swelling of the peritoneum structures involving the sesamoids. Um, really, we're looking at excessive impact activity here. Um, and uh, what you'll find is sort of altered gait pattern, pain on weight bearing, uh, or with passive range of motion of the great toe, especially in dorsiflexion or plantar flexion resisted range of motion. Uh, it can be sudden or gradual onset, so there can be acute injuries here. Oftentimes, they are presenting in more of a chronic fashion or a progressive fashion. X-rays are usually normal, so a bone scan might, might help identify this if uh, needed uh, and, uh, and if it's going to change management. Really, the, the management is symptomatic footwear and um, potentially orthosis modifications, a metatarsal pads, a stiff sole shoe, lower heel height potentially, um, some taping strategies uh, with getting the greater toe into plantar flexion, and SEDS eyes correcting techniques, stair injection if needed, and, and rarely surgery is needed. Stress fractures of the forefoot were focused primarily on this slide in terms of sesamoid and metatarsal shaft. Um, similar, similarly to the sesamoid fracture, medial is more commonly than lateral sesamoid for a stress fracture. And uh, as you know, the second metatarsal is most commonly involved metatarsal when it comes to stress fractures. Um, like obviously a overload or chronic repetitive trauma type of injury with insidious onset of symptoms and progression to point tenderness, swelling and pain. Symptoms usually precede x-ray findings are from by about two or three weeks, um, but we'll, what you potentially will eventually see is narrowing in the medullary canal, possibly a faint lucency in the cortex, periosteal thickening, uh, and uh, later on, about four or five weeks out, callus formation. Certainly, uh, you can treat metatarsal stress fractures clinically, but a bone scan or MRI uh, can help with a definitive diagnosis if it's needed. For sesamoid stress fractures, Modified weight bearing, firm sole shoe, donut pad, similar to the sesamoiditis management we previously discussed, and uh, varying degrees of uh, activity and uh, immobilization required for metatarsal stress, uh, metatarsal shaft stress fractures. It ranges from no impact to full non weight bearing and air cast boot with progression over usually about two to six weeks based on symptoms and tenderness, um, and really uh, with a return to play guided based on symptom resolution. Moving on to the fifth metatarsal, I've grouped this into two parts, part one and part two, focusing at the in the first part on the tuberosity and apophysi apophysis in um, younger individuals. And then this part two, we'll move on to more uh, metaphysis, diaphysis junction, stress fractures, and um, diaphysis stress, diaphysis uh, shaft fractures as well. So starting with the tuberosity fracture, what we're looking at is an evulsion. Um, due to an acute inversion injury, often associated with plantar flexion as well. Um, similar mechanism in an apophysis avulsion, uh, but the, obviously in a younger individual with open physis. Uh, apophysitis is more of an acidious onset type uh, mechanism with no history of acute trauma, and certainly uh, just being aware of the fact that um, accessory ossicles are present in this area as well, which are a normal variant, but can um, make a uh, diagnosis a little bit more challenging if it is present. 
what you're looking for is obviously point tenderness, swelling, um, and in an area localized to a smaller, more inferior area than a lateral ankle sprain, which certainly can be, uh, this can certainly be confused or missed uh, if focusing more on the ankle when someone comes in with that mechanism of injury. For a tuberosity uh, fracture, you're looking for a straight or, or irregular edge without cortication, and it's usually transverse versus the, uh, looking at an apophysis, which is usually smooth, round, and parallel to the metatarsal long axis. Um, rarely the tuberosity fractures are displaced for more than a few couple millimeters, and uh, you're looking for this uh, fracture line extending proximally into the metatarsal cuboid joint. With an apophysis avulsion, you're looking for an increased physis separation, and you'd have to compare that to likely to the other side to, to see this. And uh, with hypophysitis, the x-ray would be normal. With uh, an accessory ossicle, of course, you're looking for, at a smooth, round, and well-corticated -cortica structure, and again, often bilateral. With a tuberosity fracture, treatment would be weight-bearing as tolerated in a firm sole shoe for about four to eight weeks, or air cast boot if required for a couple weeks based on symptoms. Um, this can take quite a while to recover um, symptomatically. Um, certainly, you'd be looking at a referral if there is greater displacement or um, multiple fractures are present. With minimal displacement and an apophysis avulsion, again, weight bearing is tolerated with some form of um, immobilization, potentially air cast for three to six weeks. And apophysitis would be uh, oftentimes managed appropriately with relative rest and NSAIDs. Moving more distally now, we get into the area of a Jones fracture in the fifth metatarsal, which would be often a direct blow to the lateral foot or inversion and plantar fraction injury again. Uh, a di diaphyseal stress fracture, which is more of a chronic overload and progressive symptoms. And um, in this area, uh, there is a uh, risk of delayed or non-union, um, given that this is a watershed area at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction. Uh, the symptoms people will typically present with pain in the midboard of the lateral foot, swelling, point tenderness, difficulty weight bearing. With a Jones fracture, you're looking at a transverse fracture line extending into the joint between the base of the fourth and fifth metatarsals. The medial cortex is often intact initially, and there's really significant displacement. Um, contrast this to the um, apophysis avulsion or um, tuberosity fracture we just discussed on the previous slide. Well, the diaphyseal stress fracture uh, at the proximal area, it's at this watershed area we're speaking of, it can be normal in the first couple weeks with symptoms, uh, but then progressive to more of a linear lucency, periosteal reaction, widening fracture line or medullary sclerosis, uh, distal to that fourth, fifth base, metatarsal base articulation. Classification grouping both Jones fractures and proximal diaphyseal stress fractures, one, two, and three. Um, really looking at progression of these uh, radiographic findings. The narrow fracture line and absence of sclerosis in, par in type one to more widening of the fracture line and the sclerosis in two, and then a complete obliteration of the med medullary canal by sclerotic bone in type three. And that goes into, um, is important with respect to managing or uh, looking at potential management options when treating this. Four, so starting with either a Jones fracture or proximal metatarsal shaft fractures. With class one, you're looking at non-weight-bearing cast for six to eight weeks, then a very gradual increase in weight-bearing activity uh, if clinical symptoms are resolved, and the x-ray de is demonstrating interval healing. Very slow progression in these cases. Um, if you have more of a progressive condition, type two, type three, based on the x-ray findings I previously discussed, or at two or three months when class one's uh, with a non-union, what we really we should be looking at is referral for uh, potential intermedullary screw fixation. And, and we're often seeing now, considering screw fixation earlier on, um, in some cases of class two or even class one, especially if um, uh, patients are unwilling or unable to go undergo prolonged immobilization. And really, we should be looking at this in, our, in the case of our um, higher level or elite athletes. Moving distally uh, along the metatarsal shaft, for non-displaced middle and distal metatarsal shaft fractures, we're looking at weight bearing as tolerated an air cast boot for three or four weeks or a firm soled shoe, and then referring if there's a really a over 10 degree dorsal or plantar angulation or about three or four millimeters of displacement um, for ORIF. So really it is important to distinguish in this area of the metatarsal, fifth metatarsal, what is a distal or middle shaft fracture, a Jones or um, a metatarsal, metaphyseal diaphyseal junction stress fracture and a tuberosity fracture or uh, apophysis avulsion or apophysitis. Okay, so Freiberg's osteochondritis is a uh, osteochondrosis or AVN of most commonly the second metatarsal head and we're looking at a teenage population, um, athletic population often in this case. 
and uh, thought to be just uh, microtrauma or overloading, leading to blood supply interruption to that metatarsal head, uh, with pre patient presenting with uh, pain with forefoot weight bearing, tenderness and swelling of the second metatarsal head, and a stiffness of that MTP joint. With an x-ray, initially minimal findings potentially, but progressing more to subchondral sclerosis and a flattened metatarsal head with fragmentation of the physis, with the bone skin or MRI more sensitive in the early changes. And managing it, activity modification, certainly uh, metatarsal padding, footwear modification, or more uh, significant immobilization if pain is severe or symptoms persist, with rare uh, surgery needed if uh, non-operative treatment fails. Looking at the first MTP joint, I've grouped hallux valgus limitus and rigidus onto the same slide here, um, re remembering that normal gait requires about 60 degrees of uh, at first MTP dorsiflexion. Um, and hallux valgus defined as a you know, first MTP valgus deviation in that great toe um, due to progressive static subluxation of this joint with more hallux limitus, looking at decreased range of motion, and then at the end point of that progression, hallux rigidus, which is uh, ankylosis of that joint. Predisposing factors of hallux valgus, um, constricting footwear, excessive pronation, a longer first MTP or, MT or hallux, uh, trauma to the sesamoid or medial ligaments and, and other neuromuscular disorders. On an x-ray, you're going to find first MTP OA often at uh, times and uh, sesamoid displacement, loose bodies potentially. On exam, you're going to see um, progressive deformity in a hallux valgus situation, swelling and tenderness and pain over that medial MTP, plus or minus skin changes as a result of this uh, deviation in normal anatomy. With limitus presenting more with pain with weight-bearing activity, especially in the forefoot, um, excessive shoe wear underlying that first IP and second MTP, tender MTP joint and decreased range of motion. Management, varying uh, strategies here, activity modification to uh, splinting, footwear modifications with a wider toe box or stiffer sole, orthotics, stair injections, etc. And of course, surgery in, in cases that are progressive or um, limiting in terms of uh, function and, uh, and pain. Mandatorsalgia, really defined as an MTP joint synovitis, typically the second to fourth MTPs, with predisposing factors in this case being more a cavus foot, excessive pronation, claw hammer toes, dropped MTP heads, tight extensor tendons, and a Morton's foot. Um, certainly, as a result of uh, a lot of these conditions, you can get a number of other conditions as well, but metatarsalgia um, certainly being a common um, presenting complaint in primary care, we certainly would see a lot of these other conditions uh, present when they do end up presenting. The symptoms typically are forefoot pain, especially in mid-stance and push-off phase of gait, more of a gradual onset. Localized tendon is worsened by passive flexion, sometimes uh, separation between toes as well as seen. And x-ray really is looking at ruling out other pathology here making sure we're not missing things like stress fractures uh, in younger people, Fabry's osteochondritis, Morton's neuroma potentially being an issue as well. A first MTP joint sprain or turf toe can be graded from one to three, uh, with one being more mild, more of a sprain, two, a partial plantar capsule and ligament tear, two, a complete tear, often in, in number three, with often associated flexor tendon injury and, and plantar plate injury. The mechanism being a forced first MTP hyperextension and uh, predisposing factors, potentially artificial turf, has plainness or excess pronation, decreased pre-injury pre -injury ankle and MTP range of motion, flexible footwear, etc. And on exam, you're going to find, you know, mild swelling, tenderness, pain with push-up and minimal bruising to more severe and more severe disease or more severe injury, a weakness with flexion and frank MTP instability. So you want to check vertical MTP insta for for a vertical MTP instability on your exam. And when you're, uh, you would likely elicit pain with passive dorsal plantar flexion, seeing decreased active range of motion, and really you should be assessing for resistant range of motion to, to identify any associated tendon injuries here as well. An x-ray can rule out an MTP avulsion, um, and certainly there's some signs on exam that might um, lead you to this, uh, and certainly more severe injury. Uh, a bone scanner MRI can, uh, can further give you more information with respect to higher grade injuries in particular as well. For grade one injuries, really what we're, what, what we're often seeing uh, more commonly, uh, relative rest, a stiff sole shoe, maybe a toe plate, and really a gradual return when uh, symptoms have improved. Um, more severe injuries treated uh, with some period of immobilization, air cast boot with or without crutches for up to two weeks, 
and then footwear modifications, and uh, and then continuing these upon return to play as well. Uh, with grade three injuries, longer mobilization or surgery may be required. Certainly if there's a, any instability of that joint or large avulsions are present or tendon injury. Morton's neuroma um, is a compression, it leads to, is resulting from a compression of the interdigital, interdigital nerve, usually the third or fourth web space, and uh, more common in females with predisposing factors, um, often related to footwear um, and uh, other anatomic abnormalities. Uh, symptoms will typically be uh, pain with ra pain radiating into the toes, so associated sensory symptoms, neurologic symptoms of paresthesias or numbness, um, tenderness over the plantar web space, decreased sensation potentially, and sometimes a palpable nodule uh, on exam. Ultrasound usually is helpful for making this diagnosis. And footwear modifications, adding a metatarsal pad or orthosis, um, and other treatments such as ice and said steroid injections, and um, potentially surgery in cases that don't respond to conservative treatment. Lastly, on this slide uh, for dermatologic conditions, just list some things that really keep in mind when examining the foot um, that we don't forget and uh, focus specifically on MSK conditions and, and ignore more um, superficial or um, cutaneous uh, abnormalities that can certainly impair performance or, um, or cause pain. And you can review this as, as required. So that's it. Hopefully this has served as a useful review and uh, reference point when studying for exams and uh, reviewing the uh, numerous conditions of the of foot when it comes to um, primary care sports medicine. And like I said at the start of this lecture, feel free to go back and forth uh, during your review um, to help with uh, studying and, uh, and if needed uh, to reference some of the Im images that we've included in the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you.